Hi, welcome to Qubytes, your bite-sized pieces of quantum computing. My name is Rene from Malone Reply, and today we're going to talk about quantum computing for drug discovery, a very important topic. And for this, I'm honored to have a special expert guest today, Shahar Kinen. Hi, Shahar, and welcome to the show. How are you today? Very good, thanks. How are you doing, Rene? I'm doing fantastic. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background as it relates you know, to chemistry and quantum and all of, all of the goodies here? Sure. So I'm a computational chemist by training. I did my PhD in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, came to the US for a postdoc, and stayed. Um, I started Polaris Quantum Biotech with my co-founder, uh, Bill Shipman, who is Polaris CTO. Um, and myself about three years ago, and we are located in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, we're a virtual company, so we have people all over the U.S. I love this modern work style. Uh, all righty, so let's dive into our today's topic. Um, first of all, let's let's you know make the, the make everyone basically on the same page. So tell us a little bit what is the process of drug discovery like and. What is so special about, you know, this modern personalized precision medicine? So um, drug discovery is a very lengthy and complex process. The part that we are interested in is in the early stages of drug discovery, sometimes also called drug design, which is after you know what the disease is, you know, you understand the biology of the disease and you identified a specific protein, which is part of the um, cell machinery. Uh, that is not working correctly or that is overworking and you're trying to either stop that activity or enhance that activity. And that's when you're looking for a small molecule that will become your drug later on. We come into the process at this point. We are the group that can find those small molecules faster and more efficient. When we find these molecules, then they go to more testing, um, both against the specific protein, and then against other proteins to make sure that there's no side effects, and then in all sorts of models, animal models, cell size models. After all of that is finished, then those small molecules go to somebody else's, uh, pro become somebody else's problem, and then they when it's when you start doing clinical trials. And those can take five to seven years before this become a drug that you can sell in the market. Uh, so what we are interested in is really the early stages of drug discovery, drug design. And we are interested in that because those are, the way people are doing it today is through steps of trial and error. You design some molecules, um, you test them, you see if they're good or not good, you learn something, you go to the next step. Each one of those steps looks at about a thousand molecules um, and it takes the whole process, three, four steps, three years, four million dollars. It's a lengthy process, expensive process, and there is a lot of missed opportunities here just because of the length and the cost of this process. What we found out is that each of these steps is a single point optimization, so a single property optimization. You first find molecules that bind to the protein. Then you make sure that they are into synthesize. Then you maybe make sure that they can be orally available so that you can, you know, that they will become a pill. Each one of those steps is a single object optimization. We are using quantum computers to do a multi-object optimization. So instead of looking at a thousand molecules every time, we're looking at them much larger virtual chemical space, billions of molecules, and find molecules that bind to the protein, easy to synthesize, and orally available at the same step. So instead of doing three different optimizations, we're doing only a single optimization, but a multi-object optimization. And that's something we can do because we are using <coughs> sorry, a quantum computer. We're using the D-wave annealers, which are very good for optimization problems. Got it. Got it. Well, that's uh, already as answering probably my, my second question. But um, the, the process you described is also um, known as protein folding, like partially a little bit. You can use protein folding there. Um, 
we are less interested in those kind of things of protein folding. Uh, we prefer, uh, at least at these stages of the company growth, to work with cases where the protein structure is known. So you look at the protein and you, it's already folded. Um, protein folding is an area that in the last year have been through, you know, it's an amazing what's happening there, both on the experimental side and on the technological side. We work, you know, at DeepMind and at Meta and some other companies that are doing that. They're using AI, machine learning, um, and natural language processing to, to do those part of things. And in many cases, we use their outputs. We look at the outcome of what they're doing and they support what we're doing. Got it, got it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I like you're already alluding to, there's things like um, a deep fold from um, deep mind and so on, you know, that is using machine learning and AI basically to um, accelerate the process. And I think, you know, like the, the challenges the industries are facing is, is computational um, resources. And these are like what you describe are these like you know, multi-dimensional optimization problem, basically, right? You have mm -hmm. this huge search space. Yeah. And um, so how can quantum computing help in that realm? So, you know, quantum computing is a, is a big name. What we are doing is we are using annealers. Mm -hmm. um, and annealers are really good at solving optimization problems. And this is what we are doing. We are doing using an annealer to solve a multi-object optimization problem. So when we, for a specific protein and a specific set of properties that you're interested in a molecule so that that molecule will become a good drug, right? Yeah. Less toxic, easy to make, um, soluble, all of those uh, set of properties, we know how to build a, ke a virtual chemical space, large chemical space, billions of molecules, and how to translate that chemical space into a cubo formulism. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we are running on the wave. So we know how to translate chemical space to Cuba, how to translate the constraints um, that we uh, that, that are in the chemistry language to Cuba's constraints, and then we run it on D wave. Um, right. On D wave, the the constraints at the Cuba and the constraints are solved using their algorithms. Okay, so they are using their algorithms. We're using our algorithms to translate chemistry into cubes. Right. Understood. So basically, you're the translator from the, the chemistry into the quantum chemistry world, basically, right? Yes. And then translating it back, right? Because you get the answer, a, a, you know, what's the low energy state coming out of the cubo? You still need to translate it back into chemistry, into how does your molecule looks like? What's the properties of your molecule? Um, and how good is it going to be? Awesome. And, and with this, you can also build these personalized medicine, I guess, right? You have a person, for example, well, unfortunately, I don't, at least I don't, I'm not aware that I have one of a certain disease. Maybe I have, I don't just don't know, but, you know, potentially, like, let's just, just um, make this up. Like if a doctor finds a certain problem, like uh, in, in, in my body or something, and there is a certain chemical pro or a certain protein that, like you said, that is un not well behaving. And, mm -hmm. and then they would take a sample and then analyze it and uh, make a very specific drug just for one person, right? Yes, um, this is still, you know, work in progress. So this is still not something that can happen today. But even today, we're looking at smaller and smaller patient populations. Um, one of the projects that we are doing and that we published on is triple negative breast cancer. So if you look at breast cancer, there are three known mutations, but then there are patients who don't have any of these three mutations. Mm -hmm. They are the triple negative uh, patients, and they are a very small percentage of breast cancer patients. But we can find, and we're working on projects that are targeting that small population. Now, because we are don't need three years four million dollars to get to these molecules were well, way faster than that. Um, we can look at smaller patient populations because the cost of drug discovery, drug design is expensive. And yep. if you're doing it faster and cheaper, you can target smaller patient population. Uh, yep. We have shown that uh, this specific project, it took us, uh, we collaborate with another company, and this took us about six months 
the project from the beginning till the end. Um, we're waiting now to see some of those results. Wow, and that that is impacting life for a person, right? Like you're like yeah. saying, like instead of like four or five years, six months, or I, I mean, like you're saying, it's just the beginning, right? So it will yeah. get even faster and in the long term, mm -hmm. and uh, that could actually mean life or death for a person. And so yes. this is this yes. is amazing. Yes, and and quantum computing, uh, the the possibilities there for some problems. Okay, we're not going to make a, um, you know. A, a faster word document processing, but yeah. for some problems, um, the capabilities of a quantum computer can change, especially in science. So when we talk about finding the best molecules for it mm -hmm. that will become a drug, that's one of the things. When we're thinking about how you design that molecule specifically, right now we're using annealers. Um, when a gate-based computer will be available that is bigger, we can make other parts of the process even faster as well. Um, and this is something that we're really looking forward to. Yeah, no, I can, I can totally relate to that. Uh, and like you're saying, uh, that's also what I keep on telling folks when they ask me, oh, when will this be a quantum, like I'm holding up my smartphone here, yeah. when will this be a, a quantum computer inside of here? And then I tell them, well, probably never, um, because you should rather think about a quantum or a QPU, a quantum processing unit, as similar to a GPU which yep. is a graphics processing unit, an accelerator for very specific problems. Or what we're also seeing these days in, in certain computers, these VPUs, like vector processing units or tensor processing unit, super mm -hmm. well suited for AI workloads. We're going to see these, of course, you know, quantum computer might probably never be that small. We'll see maybe at some point, but definitely it's, it's meant for very specific problems. But yeah. like you're saying, these specific problems are huge and impactful for a lot of people like you're saying, drug discovery, but also fertilizers, other chemi chemical uh, simulations or optimizations, um, and then even scheduling problems, like you know, saving time for, for a lot yeah. of people, and, and then also saving, reducing carbon footprint, and or running climate models, and, and all of that stuff, like where we're reaching really the boundaries of classical computers, because you have these multidimensional problems, and so exciting. Yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? Um, on, on the D-Wave annealers, there are some uh, really interesting solutions that are being developed now. One of them is the, in the port of Los Angeles, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, um, um, cutting down um, waste, making sure that uh, you know, ships don't waste too much time, trucks, all of these things. So really interesting solutions. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any other solution you would like to mention in the quantum-inspired computation space? Um, so there are some um, interesting work done now with um, cargo, how you how you put boxes into airplanes, right? Um, that's mm -hmm. the Airbus challenge, and there are some interesting works coming out of that as well. Yeah. And the, both of these are examples of using the D-Wave annealer, you know, on solving day-to-day -day problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, while well, you mentioned the Airbus, Airbus Quantum Challenge, um, like one of my colleagues, we actually took part in the Airbus Quantum Challenge, made second place back then. Oh, neat. And yeah, I actually talked with one of my colleagues in the previous episodes of Qubytes about it. And uh, yeah, it is impressive. Like yeah, if, you, if you think about the, the problem, it's a huge optimization problem, right? Like you have a plane that has certain physical constraints. It needs to fly in the end. And it only can and, fit. And, and uh, fly balanced, right? You can't put all the heavy yeah. stuff at the front or on the side, right? Yes. Yeah. But and, exactly like that, right? They are balancing. Um, this is a multi-object optimization. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, this is um, this is pretty amazing, and uh, I, I'm I'm really impressed. Like, especially in your field, like like you're saying, it was you know personalized precision medicine, and and you know bringing down drug discovery, like the the phase of drug discovery you're working on, like the beginning or the initial phases before the clinical trials, like bringing this down to a few. Uh, months basically from years this is this is so this is will be so impactful so for so many people and and also if we think about quantum and, <clears throat> and also ai i mean when, when a lot of folks they hear about ai oh no you know the, the robots are going to kill us that kind of thing but then i always show them like there's so immense progress also for um you know computer vision like um detecting melanomes like skin cancer which can even reach this now a level that is on par with humans or even better to a certain degree. And this will scale and will enable this fantastic treatment to many, many more people in the world. And this is yep. so exciting. 
Yes, and you don't have to be there in order to employ um, AI, right? Or machine learning. You don't have to send your physicians to every part of the world. They can, you know, you can put it on a computer and that computer will reach areas that otherwise may not have ac access to that level of experience, yeah. right? So, so I think some of that technology is revolutionizing healthcare now, not, not in 10 years. And I think it's really exciting to be at this point now, uh, being able to see, to participate, to, to uh, contribute to those kind of, of revolutions. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and what was also very insightful in, in the conversation we were just having, um, that you're already uh, basically using the state, latest state of technology with annealing from D-Wave with the annealer they have, uh, which is almost 6,000 qubits or 5,070 yes. something, or I, I don't recall exactly. But uh, I, like you're saying, for very specific problems, though. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not the gate model, which is more generic, but um, you're already employing this for um, um, you know making uh, super impactful things there, and um, yeah, yep. I'm very impressed. Yep, thank you very much. <laughs> well, folks, we're already at the end of the show. Um, thank you so much, Shahar, for joining us today and sharing your insights. Again, I'm so impressed, and uh, the work you're doing is is uh, life changing for a lot of people. So um, I'm very much appreciated that you took a little bit of your time out to talk with me today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron, and always happy to talk with you. Awesome. Well, and thanks, everyone, for joining us for yet another episode of Qbytes, your bite-sized pieces of quantum computing. Uh, watch our blog and follow our social media channels to hear all about the next episodes. Subscribe to our YouTube. You might get a notification. And, of course, you can always visit the website to view all the previous episodes from Season 1 to Season 6 now. Um, take care, stay healthy, and see you soon. Bye-bye.